Well, hey, let me, uh, <laughs> let me uh, encourage you to stay standing for about eight minutes and 20 seconds <laughs> while I read the word of the Lord for today. Just think it's a really long song. You just did it for a while. And now we embark on our uh, sermon, our scripture reading for today. This is the word of the Lord. 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, down to chapter 3, verse 39. Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zariah, and the servants of David went out and met them at the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, let the young men arise and compete before us. And Joab said, let them arise. Then they arose and passed over by number, 12 for Benjamin and Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and 12 of the servants of David. And each caught his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side, so they fell down together. Therefore, that place was called Helkath Hazarim, which is at Gibeon. And the battle was very fierce that day. And Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. And the three sons of Zariah were there, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. And now Asahel was as sweet of foot as a wild gazelle. And Asahel pursued Abner, and as he went, he turned neither to the right hand nor to the left from following Abner. Then Abner looked behind him and said, is it you, Asahel? And he answered, it is I. Abner said to him, turn aside to your right hand or to your left and seize one of the young men and take his spoil. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. And Abner said again to Asahel, turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I lift up my face to your brother Joab? But he refused to turn aside. Therefore Abner struck him in the stomach with the butt of the spear so that the spear came out of his back and he fell there and died where he was. And all came to the place where Asahel had fallen and died, stood still. But Joab and Abishai pursued Abner, and as the sun was going down, they came to the hill of Ammah, which lies before Gia on the way to the wilderness of Gibeon. And the people of Benjamin gathered themselves together behind Abner and became one group and took their stand on the top of a hill. Then Abner called to Joab, shall the sword devour forever? Do you not know that the end will be bitter? How long will it be before you tell your people to turn from the pursuit of their brothers? And Joab said, as God lives, if you had not spoken, surely the men would not have given up the pursuit of their brothers until the morning. So Joab blew the trumpet and all the men stopped and pursued Israel no more, nor did they fight anymore. And Abner and his men went all that night through the Arabah. They crossed the Jordan and marching the whole morning, they came to Mahanaim. Joab returned from the pursuit of Abner and when he had gathered all the people together, there were missing from David's servants 19 men besides Asahel. But the servants of David had struck down of Benjamin 360 of Abner's men, and they took up Asahel and buried, buried him in the tomb of his father, which was at Bethlehem. And Joab and his men marched all night, and the day broke upon them at Hebron. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. And sons were born to David at Hebron. His first was Amnon of Ahinoam of Jezreel, and his second, Kiliab of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel, and the third, Absalom, the son of Makah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur, and the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, and the fifth, Shephatiah, the son of Abital, and the sixth, Ithrim of Igla, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. While there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why have you gone into my father's concubine? Then Abner was very angry over these words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head of Judah? To this day I keep showing steadfast love to the house of Saul, your father, to his brother, and to his friends, and have not given you into the hand of David, and yet you charge me with a fault concerning a woman? God, go, God do so to Abner and more also, if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba. And Ishbosheth could not answer Abner another word because he feared him. And Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, Whom does the land belong? 
Make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you to bring over all Israel to you. And he said, good, I'll make a covenant with you, but one thing I require of you, that is, you shall not see my face unless you first bring Mashal, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. Then David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, give me my wife Mashal, from whom I paid the bridal price of a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband Paltiel, the son of Laish, but her husband went with her, weeping after her all the way to Baharim. And then Abner said to him, go, return. And he returned. And Abner conferred with the elders of Israel, saying, for some time past, we have seen that you've been asking and seeking David as king over you. Now then bring it about. For the Lord has promised David, saying, by the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Abner spoke also, or also spoke to Benjamin. And then Abner went to tell David at Hebron all that Israel and the whole house of Benjamin thought good to do. When Abner came with 20 men to David at Hebron, David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him. And Abner said to David, I will arise and go and will gather all Israel to my Lord the king, that they may make a covenant with you and that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away and he went in peace. Just then the servants of David arrived with Joab from a raid, bringing much spoil with them. But Abner was not with David at Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he had gone in peace. When Joab and all the army that was with him came, it was told Joab, Abner the son of Ner came to the king, and he has let him go, and he has gone in peace. Then Joab went to the king and said, What have you done? Behold, Abner came to you. Why is it that you have sent him away so that he is gone? You know that Abner, the son of Ner, came to deceive you and to know you're going out and you're coming in and to know all that you're doing. When Joab came out from David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner and they brought him back from the cistern of Sarah. But David didn't know about it. And when Abner returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside into the midst of the gate to speak with him privately. And there he struck him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. Afterward, when David heard of it, he said, I and my kingdom are forever guiltless before the Lord for the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. May it fall upon the head of Joab and upon his father's house. And may the house of Joab never be without one who has a discharge or who is leprous or who holds a spindle or who falls by the sword or who lacks bread. So Abishai and Joab, his brother, uh, Joab and Abishai, his brother, killed Abner because he had put their brother Asahel to death in the battle at Gibeon. Then David said to Joab and to all the people who were with him, tear your clothes and put on sackcloth and mourn before Abner. And King David followed the bier. They buried Abner at Hebron, and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. And the king lamented for Abner, saying, should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bow, uh, bound, your feet were not fettered. As one falls before the wicked, you have fallen. And all the people wept again over him. Then all the people came to persuade David to eat bread while it was yet day. But David swore, saying, God, do so to me and more also, if I taste bread or anything else till the sun goes down. And all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them as everything that the king did pleased all the people. So all the people in all Israel understood that day that it had not been the king's will to put Abner, the son of Ner, to death. And the king said to his servants, Do you not know that a prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? And I was gentle today, though anointed king. These men, the sons of Zariah, are more severe than I. The Lord repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. Whew. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Got to wet the whistle a little bit after that. Eight minutes of pure reading. It's good to have long sections of scripture to read. It's good to be in God's word. Actually, one of the things that's clear in the New Testament about worship is that we should be reading publicly the scriptures. 
And so coming to a time where we can sit here for seven or eight minutes straight and listen to God's word is actually in faithful obedience to God's word to us as to how we're to worship as God's people. So that's cool. If you have your Bibles, 2 Samuel chapter 2 is where you will need to be. If you're new with us, you're going to need your Bible. This is a church where it's not optional to use it because we're trying to preach it, teach it, and hopefully take you, uh, have you take it home with you and obey what it says. We're in a large section of scripture, and so perhaps the best way for me to jump in is just to get started with a title, maybe with my name first. My name's Scott, by the way. Hello. Should probably tell you that because there's new people coming around all the time. We are so glad that you're here. I'm the lead pastor here at Doxa. Get the privilege of preaching God's word on most weeks, and uh, we're delighted that you're with us, and we're on a mission to preach faithfully 2 Samuel. So, 2 Samuel chapter 2, title of the message this morning, perhaps you can pick up on a little bit of the influence that came with this title, uh, Can't Thwart This. Nothing, huh? Well, I would just say that um, I had some inspiration going on in my head as I was studying this passage from the great theologian M.C. Hammer. The this in the title being the kingdom of God can't thwart this, can't thwart God's kingdom. It's a short title. Now it's probably a memorable title. And I hope it serves to support what's going on in the text. Uh, what we find in 2 Samuel chapter 2 at verse 12, even before from last week, but into this week, is that you can't thwart God's kingdom. But just because you can't thwart God's kingdom doesn't mean man won't try. Let me be clear. Doesn't mean you and I won't try. Okay? Okay. It's not just those people out there that don't believe in Jesus that try to thwart God's kingdom. God help us. It's in ourselves on a regular basis where our rebellion is an evidence of us trying to thwart God's kingdom. And as there's more than one way to skin a cat, there's more than one way to thwart God's kingdom. Some of us get really cute, really creative, really subtle, I'm going to hopefully unveil some of those ways that we end up thwarting God's kingdom ourselves. But before I do that, I want to get to the overall sense of why such a big passage of scripture today. And the first thing I would say to that is because narrative in the Old Testament allows us to take bigger bites of the scriptures. It's not a didactic section, and because it's narrative, it allows us to keep units together, units of thought, and this one from chapter 2, verse 12 to chapter 3, verse 39 is one unit. Now, what's going on, we have to kind of back out for a second and realize that chapter 2, verse 1, all the way to chapter 5, verse 5 is one section. And the two pieces of bread on the outside are the kingship of David established in the beginning of chapter 2, and then the kingship of David fully established in chapter 5, right? So what happens in the middle? You have Ishbosheth established, and on the end of chapter 4, into chapter 4, you have Ishbosheth removed. And then the section we're looking at today is the three failed attempts to thwart God's kingdom from Abner, the son of Ner, the commander, and really the guy with the power on Ishbosheth, more importantly, Saul's side of this equation leading Israel. And so, with these three rounds of failed attempts to thwart God's kingship, I want you to see a few things as we look at this passage. We as Christians, looking at this text in the Old Testament, would do well to marvel today that despite as many ways there are to stand in spite of God's kingdom, against God's kingdom, the various schemes of man to thwart God's kingdom, we ought to marvel that the promise of God's kingdom cannot and will not be thwarted that it ought to put wind in our sails that come what may against God's king and God's kingdom, no weapon formed against it shall prosper. So why is your head down, O Christian? Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. Chin up. 
Men may ignore the purpose of God. Men may ignore the promise of God. Men may fight against the promise of God, but it's God himself who says in Isaiah 46, I will accomplish my purpose. And there will be a day, and we have to believe it, and we believe it by faith, but we believe it because there's an empty tomb. There will be a day when the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever, Revelation 11:15. That is for sure going to happen. And what you need to know is no Abner is going to screw that up. Listen, no you is going to screw that up. No politician is going to screw that up. No confederacy is going to screw that up. It will happen. Think about the implications of that. We're going to talk about that as we go. Big idea this morning. Should be pretty straightforward now, right? All attempts to thwart the promise of the coming kingdom will fail in the end. Thank you, God. We see it kind of in three different ways. It's broken down in three attempts of Abner, three failed attempts. So it's going to break down like this. God's kingdom won't be stopped by man's opposition. We'll do that first point. Sin makes us kingdom opposers. And we're going to discuss the fact that God's promise is greater than man's power, but we have this kingdom opposition inside of us because of sin. God help us, but it will not. The kingdom will not be stopped by man's opposition. Second thing we're going to see is the kingdom will not be sought by man's selfishness. You think you can use God's kingdom as a cover to pursue your own ends, you will be sorely mistaken in the end. And the only one you're fooling is yourself because you are not fooling God. God's kingdom will not be sought by man's selfishness. Many are seeking God's kingdom in their own selfishness, thinking this is a get-out-of-hell-free card. And number three, God's kingdom will not be established by man's own way. We can appear well-meaning, but often that well-meaningness ends up in us being subtle kingdom subverters. And we're going to talk about that as well. So the big idea all attempts to thwart the promises of the kingdom coming of God will fail in the end. Let's look at the first thing. God's kingdom will not be stopped by man's opposition. Okay? And the key to this section, chapter 2, verse 12, all the way to chapter 2, verse 32, end of the chapter, the key in this section is to see Abner on the aggressive. Gotta see that. Okay? It's Abner's fault. Uh, or, or moms, maybe this one will ring home for you. Uh, he started it. Which, let's just be honest for a second, parents. If you're in that stage of life, and if you're older parents, you, you know what we're going through. If you have kids that are roughly my age, uh, he started it comes up a lot, does it not? And I'll just say, while it's annoying sometimes to hear over and over and over again. Here's what I would say. It's not unimportant, the information that you're getting, right? When someone comes and says, he started it, you need to kind of take that into account. We got to take it into account here because you got to note the movement that's happening in verse 12. It's Abner who goes out from Mahanaim to Gibeon. Remember, Mahanaim is on the eastern side, the Transjordanian area, on the east side beyond the Jordan River. He comes over to Gibeon within about five miles of Jerusalem, and he comes looking to pick a fight, right? And one ends up breaking out, but this 12v12 knife fight, okay? Don't you tell me the Bible's boring. You're not reading the good stuff, all right? Because evidently, there's this gnarly battle that goes on, and I've always, I'm kind of an MMA fan, you know, I was a bo I'm, I'm a boxing fan, so if that rubs you the wrong way, I'm sorry. Uh, but one of my just dreams has always been that two guys would sock each other in the face at the same time and both go out. You ever <laughs> dreamed about that? Is that just a weird? Ralph, you know what I'm saying, right? And I'm like looking on YouTube. There's got to be some, and there are. There are some. You can look it up later. Don't do it now, okay? But the idea of both of them knocking themselves out and falling back, it would be epic, wouldn't it? Sweet, Okay. Well, I think it is, and, and, but this is more gore. I was giving you an easy one. This is all these guys coming up, and the picture is hands on heads of each other and stabbing each other. They all fell down. That's exactly what goes on. Now, who started it? Abner started it. Really important that we see that. 
Abner started it. They all go down at the same time. They name the place Helkath Hazarim, which means the field of sword edges. That's what you name it when 12 people go into a knife fight and they all die. 12 on 12, so it's really 24 people going in and they all die. And as a result of this 12 v 12 knife fight, this battle breaks out to the event that in verse 17, it says that the battle was very fierce that day and Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. One up for David's side. But this is exactly at the point in verse 17 where we cannot miss the greater pursuit of Abner because after the battle goes poorly for Abner, Abner's on the run and Abner's pleading with Asahel who's like got the feet of a wild gazelle. I don't even know what that means. Except I'm getting the sense that he's fast, right? And so immediately what comes into my head, did you, I don't know if you guys saw this, um, fastest marathon runner in the world is this guy named Eliud Kipchoge. Do you guys know who I'm talking about? And he runs a three minute and 50 second mile. And so at this event, they put these big old treadmills at the pace of running a three minute and 50 second mile and they asked people from the event if they wanted to try it out. So people are standing in line looking to run at that pace. And so they're going and it's just person after person not being able to catch up. And you know, you know what I'm saying, right? Tips over, hits the thing and it just shoots them backward and they have this like wall of fluff that just re- absorbs them, you know, as each one of them just sails off this thing. And so, so this is exactly what I have going on in my head. Nonetheless, I'm just picturing Asahel, who's got the speed of a wild gazelle, just trucking after Abner, but it looks poor Abner, right? He's running away. Oh, please don't. He's, he's pleading with him, right? Which, by the way, this is just amazing. This guy's running like a wild gazelle with these feet that are, you know, I'm just getting this like fast pace and he's talking while he's running. Okay, I don't know about you, I don't talk while I run. I either run or we can talk. Which one do you want to do? And it's like, you know, verse, what is it, verse 20? That you, Asahel? And he's like, yes, it's me. And you're fast. This is really frustrating. And so he comes after Abner. And if we forget that it was Abner that instilled the fight in the first place, we might actually start to feel bad for Abner, who has to defend himself And this is where this exchange goes on because Asahel is going after the glory and instead he gets stuck in this really bad situation because spear beats speed every time. Am I right? Okay. And so evidently, even one of the translations has that Abner is running. He's got his spear. Asahel has just got the speed to catch up, won't let him go, and he catches him like that from behind. Spear goes through him. He dies The glory of taking out the top guy ends in a very gory way, no less. And then the sun sets, there's this pursuit with Joab and Abishai continuing to pursue Abner, but the fighting stops. And frankly, it wasn't going to end pretty, right? And he pleads with them, and you have to understand verses 26 and 27, because Abner's calling out to Job, shall the sword devour forever? I didn't want to do that. Don't you know that the end will be bitter How long will it be before you tell your people to turn from the pursuit of their brothers? And so he's saying, like, man, this could go down like we almost lost a tribe in Judges 21. Do you remember when Benjamin almost got wiped out entirely? So he's, like, pulling that back in from Israel's history to go, we don't want another one of those episodes. And then I love that Joab basically calls him on it, depending on how you take this translation. He says, as God lives, if you had not spoken... Surely the men would not have given up the pursuit of their brothers until the morning. Or another translation essentially has, if you hadn't spoken in the first place, like talking trash, none of this would have taken place in the first place. So this is on you. And nonetheless, they pull back. More fighting does not take place. But we get this account of Abner's failed attacks To the tune of in verse 30, we see that David's men suffered 19 people to die, and Abner's side suffered 360 to die. Big difference, yes? This did not go how we thought it was going to go. And then Asahel gets buried at Bethlehem. Don't overlook that site, because listen, if you can understand the significance of Bethlehem in the midst of the story, 
you're going to understand that God's kingdom cannot be thwarted because there's a future descendant of David that's born in Bethlehem from the tribe of Judah who is the son of God who lives and dies and reigns in his resurrection and his ascension forever. Asael's buried there. David was born there. Samuel anointed David there. The king of kings and lord of lords. The God-man Jesus Christ is buried there. I digress. We know the significance of Bethlehem within the story and the kingdom of God cannot fail and we know this. But listen, we've got Abner on the aggressive and we can look at Abner in this initial scene who, let's be very, very clear, he knew Yahweh had sworn the kingship to David, and yet what is he doing? He is pursuing in opposition, in a confrontational kind of way, against the kingdom of God. The reason why we know is because in the next section, he's going to literally proclaim it, that David had sworn this kingdom to, that God had sworn this kingdom to David, and he was going to, he's going to change sides in just a second. But we can look at this and think to ourselves, I cannot believe Abner was crazy enough to go against God's promise. How in the world did he do that? Why did he do that? What did he expect was going to happen? And yet, what's interesting is, and this is what happens when we read Old Testament, if we're following the narrative, is we tend to read it as, those guys screwed this up, we wouldn't have screwed it up. Let me just say, a right reading of this text from us, maybe even to add, a humble reading of this text for us, is that something like this, though God has been clear, he's established his king, and yet we're gonna go right up against him in opposition, is true and understandable to every human person who understands the doctrine of sin. Because here's what sin does, and it happens to us regularly, sin makes us stupid. I don't mean to say that. I know there's young kids in the room. Sin makes us dumb, but I'm using biblical words. And I would defend that to the T. Sin makes us dumb. Choose one or the other. I'm getting at the emphasis of the insanity of sin. I'm not choosing my words flippantly. I'm choosing my words carefully. Sin makes us insane. Like, for example... We act as kingdom opposers without even thinking about it. Think about James 21, those who are hearers and not doers of the word. Isn't that kingdom opposition? Isn't it true that you go away, you look at God's word, you stare at it, you go away, you forget what you look like because God's word's like a mirror, you walk away. And then you live in this delusion, though, that you actually are obeying God because you came to church and you heard something or you read your Bible every day, but you never live in light of what you read. So that's a subtle way of kingdom opposition. Isn't that what Abner was essentially doing? He knew the truth, but he refused to what? Submit to the truth. Isn't that our story so often? You know the truth, but you refuse to submit to the truth. I want you to understand that it's possible to know the truth and not embrace the truth. Wasn't Jesus that said there would be a man who when he doesn't obey God's word would be like a man who builds his house on the sand and when the storm comes, the house falls. It's so interesting to think of this as subtle kingdom opposition, but if Abner can quote the promise, but by lifestyle live boldly in opposition to it, so can we. We can be kingdom opposers though we know the truth. In fact, it's even possible to be a kingdom opposer who holds the truth and assaults the truth at the same time. You can hold up God's word and attack God's word simultaneously. You can, I think of the way Christian academia works, where you slither your way into a conservative seminary, a conservative publication, and you, while you say you uphold the word, you absolutely shred it and remove all of the confidence in the standard believer when they read your stuff. We can say we hold high the word of God and then deliberately disobey it in our practice. This is happening all over the place. This is happening not just in our lives, it's happening in churches, parachurch ministries, it's going on all over the place. We can say we got this high view of God's word and then we are living literally in opposition to it. Our functional practice looks different. Do you see how this can happen? We are kingdom opposers. Don't see yourself as opposite or outside of Abner here. 
And so we need to do more than hide the word in our heads. We need to hide the word in our hearts. And we need to remember that as kingdom opposers, where we often find ourselves in that place, and if God gives us the grace to see the moments that we are kingdom opposers, in the way we don't submit to God's word, in the way we assault God's word, if you find yourself sitting amongst the swine, so to speak, of the prodigal son, you need to remember that you have a savior who runs to embrace you in the moment of your confession of that stupidity. He longs to run after you. So bow a knee and you will receive the love of the king whom you have rebelled against. His name is Jesus. And then it moves and we get into the second scene and the second component of how we can thwart or attempt to thwart God's kingdom is this. It's actually in seeking it in an insincere way. God's kingdom will not be sought by man's selfishness. Okay? God's kingdom will not be sought by man's selfishness. So, despite Abner's best attempts, the kingdom is gaining ground. It says in verse 1 that David's getting stronger and stronger. You see that in chapter 3? Now, if we were to assess that in our culture, if I were to say there's somebody that's getting stronger and stronger, how would we evaluate that? Cash, cribs, and curls. Cash, cribs, how many houses you've got, and curls, how strong you are. How do I know someone's getting strong in our culture, correct? Correct. That came in two seconds, by the way. That's the dangerous part. I don't know what's going to come out sometimes. <laughs> that works, though. Cash, cribs, and curls, okay? And, and in that context, in the ancient Near East, you had two things in particular, wives and sons. That was the, and, and here's the play on wives. As much as the wives thing, <laughs> Pastor Chris said he would address this again, so thank God, uh, but I will address the political piece of this to say some of the strategy behind the multiple wives is to create allies for yourself in strategic places. So if you find where David is accumulating wives, he's accumulating them all around strategically where Ishbosheth is, for example. And a connection to a wife of that people is a, a, an attempt at being allies with them and garnering more political power to yourself. So when he describes David getting stronger and stronger, and then you get what? You get this list, right? His firstborn from this wife, his secondborn from this wife, his thirdborn from this wife. You're like, that's a mess. And here's what I would say. It, it is a mess biblically. But the author isn't looking to give us a moral take on what's going on in David's strength coming to power more and more in a real worldly way. He's wanting us to understand, worldly speaking, David's power is growing. But under the surface, what we have to understand if we know our Bibles well is this comes directly in contrast with what the word of God has already said, already said to David. For example, Deuteronomy 17, 17 says, he shall not acquire many wives for himself. Clear? Man, that's clear. And yet what's going on here, here's what I want to say as we're looking at David's strength growing, is we have to be really, really careful we don't airbrush David. And I think sometimes we just go, David's a man after God's own heart. David only sinned one time. It was a bad one. I mean, stay away, men, ladies, bathing on the roof. I wouldn't recommend that in general, ladies. But <laughs> men still, okay, pivot and walk away. Just go, all right, just go. But if we think that's the issue, we're going to miss the fact that David is shadow and Jesus is substance. So, so David's kingdom is growing, but David is not the king we're all looking for in the end, ultimately. Don't forget that even here, because here's the reality. This is something we need to chalk away. This is something ministry leaders need to know. All of the, let me get put quotes on this. All bad sins appear much earlier as little chinks in the armor. You're okay with this. You flirt a little bit in your liberty here. You go there, but you know what? David's a man after God's own heart. So what do we do? We spin it. You give him, and, and, and some of it's okay because if he doesn't have like this egregious path of sin, you would be okay with it just to go, man, there's a way to believe the best about this. Not cool with how he handled that situation, but he's not really done this before. Do you see how this could go? 
and he's your pastor, and so you kind of, and we should give benefit of the doubt to people, but it gets really messy, and then you're, everyone's shocked, like, oh, he did what with Bathsheba? And I'm telling you right now, here's the chink in the armor. I'm telling you, it's showing even earlier up, and I'm saying that because it reminds us that even as Yahweh's kingdom is advancing, David is shadow, and his descendant will be the substance of righteousness. David is shadow, and some of the shadow of David is dark, dark, dark. But Jesus is substance. He is the wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, everlasting father. Of his reign and his rule, there will be no end. David is shadow, Jesus is substance, and the author's intent is merely to identify his growing strength without comment to his error. That being said, Saul's house at the same time is what? It's becoming weaker and weaker, yet, verse 6, Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul, including an interesting power play, no less. When you start sleeping with the former king's concubines, that's basically you making, you making a play for the throne of that kingdom. And Ishbosheth is... Um, Kind of like a marionette puppet king, right? And who's the one, who's the marionettist? Abner for sure. And he's sitting there, but all of a sudden, imagine if your puppet wasn't doing what you wanted it to do, right? Ish Bosheth's like, wait, 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 you slept with who? The concubine, Saul's concubine, my dad's concubine? No, 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 I got a problem with that. And so even though he's a little bit of a paper king, he apparently isn't going to let Abner just get away with it. And so what does he do? He calls him out, doesn't he? He calls him out. He starts talking about it. He says, hey, why have you gone into my father's concubine in verse 7 of chapter 3? And Abner is set off. All this strength is now accumulating in frustration towards Ish-bosheth. How can he say this to me? How can he do this? By the way, the Bible is clear that this is what happens when you reprove a scoffer. A scoffer is somebody who denies or renounces truth just as Abner did. In fact, we're going to find him quoting it in just a verse. What happens when you reprove a scoffer is he'll hate you. And he quotes all this. He goes, man, am I a dog's head of Judah to this day? I keep showing steadfast love to the house of Saul. Steadfast love, covenant love. I have been committed to you, committed to the family, and this is how I'm treated? Fine. Fine. You want to play it that way? You were just a puppet king to me anyway. If you're going to go that way and not let me do with you what I want to get my own power, then my next play is to use my power to my own self-serving ends and make a play for position in David's kingdom. And that's exactly what he does. In verse 9, it says, God do so and more to Abner. He's speaking in the third person, which is funny when people speak in the third person about themselves. Nonetheless, this is what takes place. God do so to Abner and Mar also, if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom, what the Lord has sworn to him. See, he knows. He's going, fine, I'm going to help David get this kingdom transferred over from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba. That's what I'm going to do. Now, it sounds nice. Oh, he's helping David. But we know what's going on here, right? He was offended. He was personally offended, so let's not be deceived. This isn't conviction, you guys. This isn't him going, wow, now that I understand the promise, I'm just flattened by the fact that David is the king, and we just need to bow a knee and come under Yahweh's rulership, who is representative in David, the true risen King, no, 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 he's not doing that. This isn't conviction. This is using scripture, God's promise for self serving ends, knowing, frankly, Ishbosheth can't do anything about it. In fact, it says that as much, right? And Ishbosheth couldn't answer Abner another word because he feared him. And so I find it funny that there's a way to oppose the kingdom of God that's a way of thwarting the kingdom. But I think it's actually interesting also to examine the way that we can thwart the kingdom by seeking the kingdom of God for our own self-serving ends. And I feel like I have some great examples for this in case you're like, I'm a little confused as to what this means. Well, don't worry. I've got three pretty great examples that I pray hit home. I find it interesting how sometimes 
someone becomes an avid scripture user when they're looking to benefit themselves. Don't be deceived. When someone does that, that's not spiritual, that's selfish. You want for some examples? This one comes up often. Husbands, never ceases to amaze me the verses we memorize and ignore at the same time. Like when you go home and tell your wife, you need to obey me. The Bible says you need to submit to me. But by the way, if you're already there quoting that verse to your wife, you're fundamentally outside of the way you're supposed to be leading in the first place. And then you're quoting it to her, and the irony is your memory lasted just enough to get wives submit to your husbands, but seem to crazily omit the fact that it says husbands ought to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so you pull this line of like, hey, I know the Bible. This is what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to submit to me. Using the scriptures to your own ends. How about another one? When somebody uses scripture knowledge to their advantage in a counseling case to paint one person as the good guy over another, you think that happens? It's amazing. You get people that come in. They know the Bible because they grew up in a Christian home. Maybe we'll just put it in another marriage context. And uh, they come in, and one spouse is looking for counseling, eager for counseling, ready, ready to just unfold her life, serious problems going on. The other one knows how to play this situation, right? And so comes into the first counseling session, and man, they can just spout out every verse. Oh, I'm just holding fast to the Lord. It's been a difficult time, but I keep saying, hope in God, oh my soul, because they know exactly what they're doing. And the person comes away going, I have no idea what's going on here because I get the sense from one of the spouses that there's some problems here, but I talk to the other one, and he's just a Bible spouting machine. I can't believe this. I wonder what's going on. What's going on in that moment is that person doesn't love God's word. That person doesn't live under its authority. That person is quoting it to frustrate their spouse and confuse the counselor who is seeking help to come off as the good guy when in fact you're not the good guy. But you know the scripture is like the back of your hand. Can we see how this is happening? All right, I'll personalize it. You're like, hey, you're being offensive. That's like at us. Like, what, what's going on with you? Okay, let's do ministry for a second. You don't think this can happen in ministry? Ministry can become this for sure as a platform to self, to make it about me, to use influence to get what I want, some sort of platform or position, right? You kind of develop this so you can sell it off to somebody else who will take it. Use you guys as a platform to get somewhere else. God, help us. We need to check our motives. Here's the question. Is your faith a cover for selfish motives in some way? Or maybe even more clearly, do you use Christ's kingdom to serve you or do you serve Christ's kingdom? Do you come into a church looking for what they can do for you or do you come into a church looking for how you can give your gifts and minister God's grace to others, right? There's so often the situation even within the church where someone comes in with, I need the church to support my thing and that's why you come and then if it doesn't work, you bounce to the next church and you bounce to the next church and you bounce to the next church and you bounce to the next church and, the next church, and, the next church, and it could be that perhaps even a well-meaning thing, and that's why it gets confusing. You're like, I'm already serving Christ's kingdom. And you're like, wait a minute, are you serving your part within Christ's kingdom as the ultimate thing? Do you use Christ's kingdom to serve you or do you serve Christ's kingdom? I think Abner had that messed up, but it looked like he was seeking God's kingdom. I'm gonna bring all of Israel under David. Now, why did he do that? Because he was upset and offended that Ishbosheth had a problem with him sleeping with Saul's concubine. And then we get to the third element. God's kingdom will not be established by man's own way. Okay? God's kingdom will not be established by man's own way. God's going to do it his way. He didn't need us to help. He's going to do it his way. Now, it's interesting because Abner's like, fine, I'm so mad at Ishbosheth. I've got all the power in the kingdom. I'm taking my power. I'm using it as leverage to bring all the tribes of Israel over under the reign and rule of David. So Abner's ready to make a deal. We see this, right, in verse 12. 
I mean, he is ready. He sends messengers. To whom does the land belong? Make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand will be with you to bring all Israel over to you. And so the negotiations begin. And David's thinking about it, and he's like, Ugh. okay, I'm down. Let's do this. But one condition. I want Mashal back. You guys remember what happened to Mashal? Saul had set that up. That was kind of messed up, wasn't it? Luring in David, promising things, and then passing Mishal off to someone else. And, and, and listen, I think there is some romance to this. If someone steals Aaron, we're going to have a problem, you know? Because, like, Aaron's the best, and I love her, and I would defend her, and there's, there's a sweetness to this, right? You're like, oh, David. He's like, I will not let you come over in a covenant until you bring me my wife. And there, and there is kind of some, I think, some butterflies there. But I also think this is a strategic play on David's part. I think there's more rhyme to the reason as to why he's pulling Mishal in because the idea would be if he and Mishal could have a kid, it could go a long way in uniting these two kingdoms together. And so he goes, I, listen, I'm down Let's try to make this happen. Why don't you bring Mishal over with the hope that they could unite his house and Saul's house, which actually ends up proving to be ineffective in the end. We'll see that in 2 Samuel chapter 6. But the whole scene is sad, isn't it? The husband of Mishal walking like Charlie Brown style, like crying as the wife is getting taken away. And they're like, yeah, go return. Like, that's my wife. What do you mean? I mean, the whole thing is just so sad. He's bawling his eyes out. And I just got to say, Saul, he started this one, didn't he? Saul is entirely to blame for this, making his daughter a pawn in the first place. But Ishbosheth is asked, Abner comes through, Mishal comes to David, Abner convenes the elders of Israel, they have this conversation. You've been hearing about David, you've been wanting David to lead. Let's make it happen. What do you think? And Abner takes the news to David. And, and, and it's interesting because there's this growing respect and trust such that Abner went off in peace, it says three times. He went off in peace in verse 21. He went off in peace in verse 22. And he went off in peace in verse 23. That there had been some relationship established by David with Abner that Abner felt at peace, which explains why probably being promised peace he would walk into the scenario to get himself killed in the first place. His guard is down. David has promised him what he's promised. And so Joab ends up killing Abner. Joab comes back from a raid. Here's what's going on in verse 22. In verse 23, when Joab and all the army that was with him came, it was told him that Abner had been around and he had gone in peace. And Joab's got a problem with this. Why? Well, we hear about it, don't we? On the surface, his problem is, you killed my brother. You killed Asahel, which in and of itself was in the midst of battle, so you wouldn't have avenged that. But he's upset, and the text doesn't explicitly say this, but I do believe there is kind of under the surface, also Abner was a threatening rivalry to Joab. If Abner comes over, Abner was the big dog on Israel's side, and Joab is the leader on David's side, and David's hobnobbing with Abner, hanging out, giving him peace, all this stuff. Maybe his position was threatened, and so Joab takes care of Abner, kills him, says it's to avenge his brother, and yet under the surface, what it seems like is that there's this revenge taking place that actually ends up subverting what was going on to establish these two kingdoms together. Joab may come off as concerned with Yahweh's kingship, but it's like us in so many ways that we can make a move for God's kingdom that's far more concerned about my place in the story than God's kingdom unfolding the way God wants it to be done. Or in other words, my will be done versus God's will be done. I think it's possible that we can, like Joab, 
appear well-meaning and yet subvert God's kingdom by seeking first God's kingdom in our way instead of seeking first God's kingdom in his righteousness and letting all those things be taken care of God's way. The minute we get involved and try to do things our way, things start to fall apart. And what happens is, as soon as David gets wind that Joab has murdered Abner, he immediately starts going, what me? Right? Verse 28, I and my kingdom are forever guiltless before the Lord for the blood of Abner. That wasn't me. He is quick to proclaim his innocence. He even gets into calling down this curse on Joab, a curse so intense for the record, Joab wouldn't even have been able to go into worship. He says in verse 29, may it fall upon the head of Joab and upon all his father's house, and may the house of Joab never be without one who has a discharge or who is leprous or who holds a spindle, which is like a crutch, or who falls by the sword or who lacks bread. David is calling down a curse. Then David orders Joab to mourn Abner, the very one he killed, all the while showing his desire to honor Abner himself. He wants it to be clear that this was him leading, so he follows the bier in verse 31. He's mourning at the sight. He's open weeping. He's lamenting. He's even declaring in his own lament, should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, your feet were not fettered. As one falls before the wicked, you have fallen. David is addressing the fact that he's dying like a criminal and yet was nothing of the sort. David is lamenting the fact that Abner had done nothing wrong to deserve that death. But even Abner's death can't stop God's kingdom. In similar fashion, David's descendant will die an unjust death as well. And that will be the king's will that it happen. And far from stopping the kingdom, through the death of David's descendant, the gates of the kingdom will fly wide open to all who will repent and believe in the Davidic descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ. That we can see this reality where you try to subvert God's kingdom by killing off a key servant, and it turns out you can't stop God's plan. It continues to go forward. Jesus actually in his death, which is trying to be a means of subversion of God's plan, Jesus ends up subverting the kingdom of the world in its ways by dying, by rising, and by drawing allegiance to people, not by forcing them to come under his reign, but in measure with David himself in verse 39 who says, I was gentle today, though anointed king. They believe David, but here's here's the way Jesus subverts the kingdom. He is king and he is Lord. And he draws us in by his gentleness and his lowliness, doesn't he? Come unto me, was said last week, all who are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and I will give rest to your souls. This is how God's kingdom goes forward. Man's best attempt to think he's subverting God's kingdom in the end is Jesus' demonstration to the world that the ways of the kingdoms of this world have been subverted, and he will conquer and rule and reign as the gentle and lowly king who calls sinners and sufferers to himself to receive forgiveness of their sins and to be welcomed into the kingdom of God by grace and grace alone. And so we celebrate as we look at chapters two and three that however many attempts in the best schemes of man that may exist, Jesus Christ and his kingship endures and will come again And Christians ought to act differently, though what we see in the world is the schemes of man. We know in the word, God reigns and rules. Let's pray.
Father, it is a great joy to teach your word, and it is an even greater joy to know what your word says, to follow it by faith, to trust you, that you will have your kingdom come. It has already come in Jesus, that we who are saved are seated with him already in the heavenlies, and yet we have this anticipation of a future day where we will rule and reign with you for eternity. God, I pray that you would do the work to draw more hearts to yourself. I pray that you would do the work in hearts to remind those who have yet to know you that you are the king who is gentle and lowly in heart, and you call all to yourself who would turn from their sin and trust in Jesus. You give your kingship as a gift to those who trust in you. May it be true today. We pray this in Jesus' name. 